camera's all ready to go. Yeah. All right. Oh, yours is in the hang up. Uh, it will be in, as soon as I sit down. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Marlon Dutra. He's, uh, he and I have been friends for about 11 years, almost 12 years. And uh, he was here about four years ago talking about uh, large scale deployments of LTSP in Brazil. And, uh, yes, that was yeah. <laughs> We were all impressed because he had 1,200 users. And now he's got 1.2 billion. So I'm going to turn it over to Marlon. He's going to tell us all about Facebook and how it works and what's going on there. So thank you. So hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here again. So last time I came in here to talk about the RTSP cluster. I'm not sure if it's still alive because we don't have the contract. But, but today I'm going to talk about something. <laughs> and uh, so, in addition to the obvious bug, I would strongly recommend everybody to replace the private keys as well. Yeah. So there is a big possibility that the private keys have been leaked. So not all the certificates. Like uh, I think that most of the CAs will, if you have uh, your certificate signed by CA, like very signed, they will probably resign the new certificate for free, uh, or at least for a very low fee, not the usual price. Because this bug like is also big. So they are collaborating to, to give a new certificate. But don't don't just get a new certificate out of the same private key. So generate a new private key, a new certificate request, and then send to them and sign the new private key. So this is this is pretty important. So it's it's probably as important as uh, update numbers as well. And uh, we did this on Friday. So Friday we worked basically the whole night to Saturday. We have like three, four thousand work balancers that turn made the SSL connect, and uh, we update all of them basically at once. It was like uh, all hands on deck to fix this bug. So, and uh, not only this, we update the whole thing, and uh, we, we basically expired all our keys, and we made new keys, and we got them signed the next day. So Facebook is completely presented. So, so yeah. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about an hour, more or less, and I'm gonna open for questions, so if you have if you guys have any questions, please ask me. Okay. Um, there's a lot of stuff, so I don't expect everybody <laughs> to understand exactly what I'm saying. If it's too confusing, just raise your hand and ask me to explain in different words. But I'll try to be as easy as possible for things that are uh, So first of all, we're gonna talk a little bit about history. It's, it's, it's very short, just for you guys to have a sense of how things are started, basically. Most of the projects back then, 2004, when Facebook started in 2003, uh, most of them started as this architecture. Linux, Sabach, MySQL, PHP. It's, it's, not, it, it's not this today, but it's, it's still similar. So there's a lot of stuff that is still being used. And then uh, most of the sites, when they start and they grow, one of the first things that people did in the past, and some people still do today, they just add new servers and they use DNS protocol to, to load balance those servers. It works well if you have like few servers. So if you have like let's say 10 servers, 5 servers, you can pretty much, when whenever people ask for your host name, <coughs> instead of one address, just one server. Today we do not do that. If you try to host www.facebook.com, you get just one equipment for and just one equipment service. And I'll tell you guys why. So this is the way it started. So if they, <coughs> they added some servers, this is pretty crap because if you lose a server, there is no health check mechanism. It basically, will black hole some of the traffic. So in this scenario, with two servers, if I lose a server or black hole half of the traffic, unless I assign the, the, the bad IP address to another host. And uh, one of the things that Facebook did in the past, in 2004, five. When things started growing, they needed more and more servers. So instead of using the, the, the they started using uh, subdomains like Harvard.facebook.com, Stanford.facebook.com, VA, or uh, Those domains still exist. So if you access now Harvard.facebook without the, the Facebook, Harvard.facebook.com will still redirect you to the WPAC. So this is a legacy. So this is the way they. Very slow now. Yeah. And uh, so basically, this is the way it was in the past. Another thing that they did, and uh, if you look at this Harvard, Stanford, they have a three-hour different time zone. 
So, so the peak times were three hours apart. So they moved servers to to attend one of the sub sites, depend on the hour of the peak. So th this was all made. They did this every day. So of course, like, well, all of this for fortunately is done, and today it's most of the system is up to And uh, one of the basic things that people do today, they will separate the front end and the, the, the back end. So Facebook didn't start that way. It started everything basically with the same server, and as it grew, they separated the back end. So, so basically the front end would run Linux, Apache, and PHP, and uh, MySQL would be separate servers. So this remains up to this day, but it's a little bit more complex. So basically, today we're going to talk about front end. Uh, back end is very complex, so we need like a separate talk to talk about that. Probably more than one talk. So we're going to focus on front, front end and how we route users to the Facebook front end clusters. And uh, there's a lot of history in this since 2004 to now, so I'll just jump to now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before going into the details, uh, so this is this is our. This is our traffic in a weekly cycle. So the whole cycle that we have in Facebook is a weekly. So if you look at this graph over the months and over the years, they repeat like every single day. So the shape of the graph is the same <coughs> every single day. And uh, so basically we have our, so our peak day every week is Monday. So Monday is the day that we get that we aggress more traffic from, uh, from the system. And then the traffic will slow down. Saturday is the best day for so usually if you have a big event, you know, say when I show up the cluster, we can do a Saturday because the traffic is going to What time of day are those daily peaks? Oh, I'll show in the next slide. And, uh, and, Saturday, and Sunday, it, it gets more hard. Here's the ingress. If you notice here, the ingress on Sunday is bigger than the ingress on Monday. That's the, that's the busiest thing. Uh, the, the theory behind this is that most people do a lot of stuff in the weekend and then they publish all the pictures on yeah. the Sunday evening. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Sunday evening we have a lot of traffic coming, even in every time zone. Of course. We have a lot of traffic in the video uploads and photo uploads. And uh, so all the, all those people upload the pictures here, and most of those pictures will get seen on Monday. So that's why you have the opposite of Monday. <laughs> so on Monday morning you go and see Facebook and you see like the big flow of pictures that people publish on Sunday evening. So this happens every week. It's the same thing every week. If you look at the day cycle, and uh, <coughs> just once in the day, it looks like this. This, is global, this is the global traffic in the Pacific time zone. So for us, the global peak is between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. That's very convenient for us, because we have all people in the office. So usually people get there like by 10, and we leave like 5, 6, 7. So it's very convenient. Usually most of the problems related to traffic they are in the peak time because all the clusters are, are, are not melting because we have an experiment about it, they are really, really hot. So this is pretty convenient. Of course, it was just an accident. If you were in a different time zone, and uh, this is just this is the combination of all time zones. So this graph alone doesn't make sense. But if you look at this graph against the map, it kind of makes sense. So basically, when we start. When we start the peak here, basically it's when the, this region of the world here is getting to be. So we have a we have the Pacific Ocean that there's virtually <coughs> wire there, so the traffic is very low, it starts to run up. And then we get basically in the, the first map here is when this all this region are big. So we have like millions and millions of users in Indonesia, we have like almost a hundred million users in India, Korea, Japan are all pretty big, but they are not nearly as big as Europe. So when, the, when Europe starts getting a peak, and usually the peak in each time zone is in the evening. It's like by 7, 8 p.m. That's when the, the specific time zone is big. And then when, when Europe gets a peak, that's when we have this problem around here. And then, uh, so there's only three hours of difference between the east coast of South America and Europe. So basically in the, in the east coast of the west. So Usually when, when this side is finished the peak here, so basically it's GMT, so when this is finished the peak here, the peak starts here. So basically we get most of this stuff together in peak. That's when we hit like the, the 
maximum amount of capacity for a certain period. And then it goes down. It goes down because Europe goes to sleep, so these periods are right overnight. And then so it goes up again. It goes up again because we have the second peak that is the West Coast. So there is too many people here. So the, the, the East Coast is still in peak because it's only three hours apart. And then we have a few people here living here in this portion of the country, and then the peak comes here in Mexico. And then it goes down because like there is only Hawaii and some islands. So there's not, there's not too much drama. And then this happens every day. It's, it's very nice for us because it's very predictable. So we can have alarms along the shape. <coughs> if anything happens and the path <coughs> starts moving down or moving up, we have alarms that fire telling us that there is something wrong. Of course, the alarm doesn't, won't tell what. We have other alarms to cover it. But usually when we have the worst problems, the first thing that everybody knows is that traffic goes down. So if you have like a message outage or like a news feed outage, the total traffic will, will go down immediately. So we have some dips in the graph. I don't have any graphs to show you, but we have some pretty bad, bad dips sometimes. We never got to zero. So I've been there for almost two years. And uh, we never got like an egress drop that went close to zero. So the worst that I have seen was like 30%. Because the infrastructure is so distributed that's virtually impossible to, for everything to go down at the same time. If you look at a specific time zone, let's say the eastern time zone, so this the graph will look a little bit a little bit different. So we have the first first peak around 1 p.m. and then it goes down, and you have a second peak around 8 p.m. This varies a little bit. Country to country. If you look at South America, the, uh, it's a little bit later, the, the peak, peak. It varies along the year. So if the sun sets later, the peak will be there. So. And then I think by this time of the year, probably the peak is going to be So it kind of makes sense. So usually people around noon, they, they get access to a lot of Facebook because they're at the lunch time. And then they go back to work and then they get home and they access a lot of Facebook. Mm -hmm. they got, like, And uh, so this repeats every day. If you look at if you look at the 24 time zones, it basically will be the same thing, but just with the hours shifting <coughs> inside the country. In terms of numbers, when we are peak, like noon or 1 p.m. on Pacific time, uh, the, all the clusters sound we are getting around <coughs> 13 meters request per second, and uh, four or five meters of tennis picture. So basically, we are on put in five to four or five meters. And uh, we keep a lot of established connections. So when you access Facebook, your browser will keep established connection for a few minutes in case you need to do more stuff. And uh, most of the cell phones, if you use Facebook Messenger, the Messenger will, will permanently keep a connection established with us for the notification. So we don't need to use the push notifications from Apple. We need that. We, we use this if the phone, if your phone is dead, because uh, then our app can communicate with you. But if the phone doesn't sleep, we keep it established. So during peak, we have 206 million established connections. That's a lot of memory. And that's one of the main reasons we have so many load times. Because each connection costs, I don't know, 1K, 2K, to keep them established. So this is pretty, pretty impressive. Yes, established. Yes, it's pretty great. <coughs> but that's, that doesn't cost CPU. So when you, when you want to keep like established connections, it's just memory. If, the problem is RPS. RPS costs a lot of CPU, especially small requests. So when you access Facebook, each profile picture, each CSS or JavaScript, anything that you were requested from the site is a new request for us. So that's why you have so, so many requests per second. That costs lots and lots and lots of CPU. And then that's the second reason why we need to have a lot of balancers because otherwise they would be lost. So the, the Amount of active people global today is 1.23 billion. So that's the number of people that have accessed the site in the last 30 days. Uh, we just hit 1 billion in global. So the traffic is shifting pretty aggressively to global in the last few years. And then we, we need to adapt the infrastructure to this because the mobile is horrible. When you serve desktop, it's so easy because most of the people, they have wired connection at home. They have like cable mode, as in this house. When you go to mobile, most of the traffic is coming from 3G, 4G networks. And uh, here in the US, we have like a good network. In most of the Europe, the Europe, we have good networks. But when you go to the third world countries, it's pretty bad. So it's a lot of packet loss. Some acronyms up there I don't 
uh, no, must as, as well be active people and daily active people, DAP and MEP. Which one? Okay, so uh, SPDY. Oh, SPD. SPD is the new protocol that Google is trying to replace HTTP. So we support both HTTP and SPD in our front end process. So most of the, the traffic, most people are using Chrome today. And usually, <coughs> Chrome, when the server supports SPD, the Chrome will talk to SPD to us instead of talking HTTP. It's much more, it's much more efficient. So you can multiplex the connections. And it's much better for, for both sides. HTTP 2.0 will probably replace SPD. So the draft of HTTP 2.0 is basically is basically based on native on SPD. And what was MAP and DAF again? Oh, MAP is monthly active people, and uh, DAF is daily active people. Uh, people that have access to Facebook in the last 24 hours. How do you determine if somebody is mobile or not? What's your definition? In the user agent. The requests. When, so when you get the requests, even from either from the browser or from the, our native applications, we can determine from the user agent. If the user is coming from Android or iPhone or coming from uh, Google Desktop. So a tablet, uh, you call that a mobile device? We call that a mobile. Right. We call it a mobile. So an iPad is a mobile device. iPad is a mobile device, yes, that's, that's right. It's a mobile device. Uh, do you have a sense for how many people are using the Facebook app? Versus yes, versus we have versus the numbers definitely, but I don't have anything. Okay. So I think it's probably half of this or something like this. Because uh, smartphones are super common here, but when you go to third world, it's not that common. So there's a lot of people using the M on Facebook. Right now. So that's more than 200 million people using the M We call it M site. So, so daily we have 757 million people using the site. That's, that's not all at the same time because we have people around the world. So uh, even even in peak, when we're in peak, doesn't mean that we have 700 people access to the site. We have much less. And 80% of the users are outside the country. So that's that's pretty, we have 170 million users here. Close to 200. 170 million users? Yeah, it's more than half of the population. 320 million people in the population. Yes, it's half the population. And, uh, but 80% of the users are outside the US. So this poses a big challenge, <coughs> a big challenge because the network is out there, and then several countries are pretty horrible, so the apps, they need to handle this pretty well. And uh, yeah, 73% of the users are mobile. This is growing more and more and more. So eventually, you get to 80%. It'll never be 100%, of course. You get close to it. And we have, I don't have the number here, but I think that we publish. We have a number that tracks the number of people that's mobile only. So people that have never accessed the site through a desktop. They always access from mobile. That's very common in the in developing markets. So if you go to India, so India we have I think India has one billion plus people and we have this. And we have only hundred million users now. So there is a huge potential for growth. And most of the growth in India are mobile only. It's pretty it's pretty interesting. So that's why the company is focusing a lot on the, on the mobile side of the infrastructure. So the infrastructure. So basically, we have now four big data centers. Uh, so we have Prineville, and uh, we have Virginia. This is Oregon. We have Virginia. No, we have, yeah, Virginia, Ashburn, Virginia. We have Forest City in North Carolina. We have a new one that will be the biggest one here in Iowa, in the, very close to Des Moines, in a city called Altoona. It's by the I-80. And uh, we have this one in uh, Lulu, that's in north of Sweden. It's uh, just 35 miles off the Arctic Circle. It's super cold. <laughs> and uh, in this, this new data center, both Prime View and uh, this here in Sweden, we don't have air conditioning. We just pull air from outside. And that's okay. <laughs> because it's very cold. And uh, all these specifications of our data center are public. We have a project called movingcompute.org where we publish the specification of all our servers. Now we have switches and the storage and the, the whole data center, all the, the air conditioning, the, all the, the airflow system, and all the thermodynamic system. It's very, very nice. We have very, very good data center people working there. And uh, this, I think that we start sending traffic here probably by the end of this year. This is going to be pretty big. So, so is it all the data centers? Yeah, that's all. Nothing in Asia? Nothing in Asia. But they are big. 
So if 80% of your traffic is from outside the United States, yes. why are all your data centers in the United Cost. States? Cost. Yeah. Having a data center here is still much cheaper than the rest of the world. Really? Much power, because we have most of them are clean energy. So right in view, there is a hydro plant very close to it. And Iowa will be all <coughs> wind power. And uh, Ashburn, is all, Ashburn is all ours. We rent the place, so we don't have much power. Rate. And uh, North Carolina has a hydro plant close to it. So, so the power is cheap, and uh, the, the telecommunication and lar large bandwidth is much, much cheaper than the rest of the world. And that's when I think eventually we start having data centers somewhere else, but not yet. So, how large you say it's very big? How large is your new We have more than 100,000 servers. 100,000 servers? More, only this one. Yeah, and Iowa, Iowa will be bigger. So yeah, it's it's too big. We start we start building smaller data centers in the future because it's it, it's too big. It's, it's difficult to manage. So this data center here, it's 400 yards from end to end, each one. Wow. Yeah, it's huge. People bike inside the data center because you can't walk. It would take several minutes to walk. So yeah, we have bikes in the data center. So if if you call sometimes <coughs> because you have a problem in the server, they will bike to the to, 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 to fix it because it's, it's too big. I've never been there, I'll be there in May or June, so we schedule it. And uh, so in this well, prime view, we have prime prime one, that's the first one, and we have prime two, that's an exact copy of the first one. And this is prime four, I don't know what this came between. So this is a four, so this is only cold storage. So this is a lot of storage capacity to hold log <coughs> and things that we don't need to access too often. And uh, it's too expensive to store that data in like spinning disks all the time. So, so the cold storage is very good. All the specification of the cold storage is over as well. So we have like one petabyte of data per second. And we have lots of servers. <laughs> it's pretty insane. Well, and, how, how, big uh, are your, how big are your servers? Uh, it's usually, it, we have five scoops. And I, I think now it's six with the cold storage. So it varies from a lot of CPU, a lot of memory, a lot of disk, a lot, a lot of IO. So we very I think the most powerful ones, it's today it would be like 200 gig of memory, 40 cores or 32 cores, and um, there, there either spinning disk or flash, depending on how much you want. Intel processor. It's all Intel. It's all Intel. We've been trying other stuff, but nothing actually have to take it off. So basically today it's all Intel. We've been using the Ivy Bridge processors lately, so they are <laughs> super good. You can go pretty much close to 90%, and they're still going very well. Mm. That your server. Mm. Yeah, my all of us uh, we have a dev server, so we work with it. I don't work the laptop. I only use my laptop as an SSH client and to use a browser. So my dev server has 148 or 46 gigs of memory, 40 cores, and two petabytes of things. And that's my dev server. It's a bare metal. It's not virtual machines. We we okay. don't do virtual machines. It's all bare metal. Are you going to bury that because of tornadoes? <laughs> yeah, actually, not the, the Oregon the, one. I mean, the Iowa one. Yeah, the whole the whole reason of having three data centers is <coughs> really strong. so we have earthquakes here, then we have hurricanes here, and we have tornadoes. Here. So actually, we can protect from the whole stuff. And here, it's pretty calm actually. So actually, the, the whole strategic plan for distributing data center around the country is to protect from different things. When we have the same hurricane last year, yes, or two years ago, we had we had shut down the whole Ashburn. Uh, not that we, not because we lost the data center, but we lost transatlantic capacity because some of the fibers have been cut, and uh, and we didn't have enough bandwidth out of the data center, so we need basically to shut, move the traffic away because it was too bad. And uh, and when we have we have like a couple months ago last summer we had a heat wave here. No, we have like the cold, cold the cold yeah. cycle. And uh, oh, the North Carolina Power Authority, whatever, they asked us to reduce traffic there because we, we, we consume a lot of power, the megawatts. And uh, Google has been a tender very close to us. And they called us and they asked, hey, can you guys reduce the power consumption because we are like melting the system? And we shift most of the traffic to the other side of the country to, to relieve a little bit the power consumption. And we saved them like 300 uh, kilowatts or something <laughs> just by moving traffic to, to another. So we have things happening everywhere, all the time. So it's it's good when you have capacity like spread around the board. So like whenever, whenever, whatever happens, like nature events or like cold or hurricanes or whatever, we can move traffic from, from here to there. And uh, as we have more and more data centers, there will be pretty much. Pretty so much does that easy. mean that you have everybody's data 
in every one of those yes. centers? Yes. Today, yes. We there, wanna, there, there are mirrors of, uh, there, We have full mirrors in all the data centers. We do want to keep that forever. Because each data center needs to be as big as the next one, and that's too expensive. So this data center in Iowa will cost us like almost two billion dollars. Two mm -hmm. million dollars? Two billion dollars. Wow. Because it needs to be as big as the previous one. Mm -hmm. Because it needs to copy everything. And uh, so this model, we have to break this model eventually and have smaller data center with extended <coughs> data so we can have uh, smaller and uh, cheaper data centers. What's the pipeline between the data centers? Oh, it's <coughs> Several terabytes. <coughs> yeah, and uh, it's, it's all, most of the links are 10 gigabits. And we are starting to point the first 100 gigabits now. So we are one of the top five customers from to Juniper and Cisco to deploy the first 100 gigabit interface. Hmm. We already have 100 gigabit between two data centers. And uh, so we have a bunch of them. And we just use uh, use <coughs> Multipath and BGP to, to use all of them. And the whole network is in the US. So in the beginning, we had two, only two data centers. So we had Ashburn, that's not our data center, but we rent for space. And we had one data center in Santa Clara that we are fully decommissioning this year because it's too expensive. The square foot is very expensive and the power in the Bay Area is insanely expensive. That's everything else. Everything is expensive. So in the beginning, basically, we separate the world in east of Mississippi and west of Mississippi. So it was pretty easy to route. Just geo IP and we route like users to one in a And uh, so basically, the west side would cover the whole Asia and the east side would cover South America and Europe and Africa. So it was super simple. But now, it's, uh, things are a little bit more complex. So besides the data center, we have a lot of edge locations where we have a couple servers, like 80 or 120 servers. And they're very small, just usually 10 racks or 8 racks. <coughs> and uh, we have 25 of those. This is growing pretty aggressively. So we have a new mob coming every month or every two months. And then we have, basically we have them throughout the world. We have Africa pretty soon, we have one in Australia pretty soon. And uh, we'll have more South America, Argentina is coming. So basically, when we terminate user, we are not terminate user directly to the end data <coughs> We usually route all the users to POPs. So we establish your SSL connection there, and the TCP connection. And then uh, from the POP data centers, we have big backhauls, of a huge pool of established connections. That's much faster. I'll explain that a little more in the next slide. So this is now is 2020 something. <coughs> so when we have a lot of data centers or a lot of pop, the main challenge is, is, is where to route user, each user to, to which pop. So this, is, this looks simple when you look from a geographic perspective, but um, not everything relates to geography. So we have like countries <coughs> like Japan and Korea, they are very close geographically but the connectivity between the countries is very poor. So usually they talk to each other by going to the countries and coming back. So we need to take that into consideration. So, and, uh, so basically, when a, a user needs to talk to Facebook, the first, first, the very first, first thing that you need to do is to translate the www address to an IP address. That's the first, first thing that the browser do when you type. And uh, so you talk to your ISP's DNS server. And the DNS server, um, possibly you have their IP address, their host name caching, but we send like two million details, so we will expire pretty soon. And then the ISP DNS server will talk to, to our DNS infrastructure through the root server. And then uh, our infrastructure basically is not a simple DNS server. It's, uh, it's what we call a DNS load balance, or a global load balance, also known as uh, GOP. So that this is the first layer of load balancing, the DNS level. And uh, so if you if you run post dot 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 on Facebook right now from here, it's very likely that you're gonna route to the pop in Chicago, that's the closest one. Because we we know a lot of stuff like the ASN they were coming from and the GOAP and a lot of other data and I'll talk to you more about it in the next And then uh, the DNS will do all the calculations super fast and respond to you. The same thing for IPv6. And uh, it's, it might happen that we route IPv6 to a pop and maybe IPv4 to a different pop because the internet, even with the internet getting to its tank now, it, we don't have the same amount of different routes that we have in IPv4 for IPv6. So once you have the IP address, 
the next thing that the browser will do is to establish the connection, to establish an HTTPS with the So then we talk with the, the layers of load balancer here. So we, we establish the connection, we send a get to the load balancer. The load balancer usually have usually has a big cache here. So if, if it's a static content and the content is the cache, the load balancer will respond to the, the request itself. Otherwise, it needs to process the, the request. And uh, so the first layer of load balancer is uh, the GLB. We have a software called Cartographer. We made that at home. We used to use business solutions for this, but they were all horrible for this scale. They are pretty good for like medium scales, but when we got to this scale, uh, they just like, they, they didn't want to solve the problems to us anymore because we were probably the only client that they had with this chance. So they just like, hey guys, make your own solution and then don't bother with this. So we start doing the, the, this solution. So basically, uh, so the whole thing, we have all the DNS resolver, each provider has a big few resolvers, and uh, we try to create a big map of them and attach them to the closest edge. Edge pop is the same thing. Use the both those. And uh, also, the size of this, it's not only, like, I could, it could be as easy as getting all, get the whole Detroit area in a route to Chicago. That would be super simple. But what if Chicago is overcapacity? Because it has traffic from, from all, all over the place around Chicago. So the size of this cartography takes care of the both things. It's also, it, it has like a big vision of the world of all the clusters. It know how much capacity it can have and how much capacity it's having. So imagine a, a, a traffic like this, and uh, we have like, this is very common. And uh, so we have like a limit capacity here. So I have a pop, let's say, let's say that I open a pop here in Detroit. I'll have a fixed limit of RPS that I can do, let's say 100,000. So I can't, I can't send more traffic than this. So I need to share the traffic to other clubs. So cartographer takes care of this. So one of the way cartographers know which pop so when you have like you, your resolver, your let's say Comcast Detroit. When you have Comcast Detroit, we try to create a list of the best pops to go like. Right? So the best would be Chicago, then let's say would be like New York. And <coughs> so we need to create that list. So the we have a system called Sonar. That's very interesting. Then we made that at home as well. So basically we do a sample experiment for like 0.001% of the users. So those users that are selected to do the experiment, basically, when they access Facebook, they fetch a profile picture from each different form. And uh, then the user will send the result to us, okay, I got the profile pictures from, for the, from these bulbs, and this was the latest, how, how, how many seconds it took to take from each of the bulbs. And then we have a lot of data coming from the users, and then we have a big map reduce job in the other that will calculate, okay, this resolver here in Comcast, Detroit, the best box will be Chicago, then New York, then Miami, then whatever. Do you keep your time to live low just in case you have a congestion, say, at Chicago that it quickly will revert, or is it, if it's cash, that it's going to keep doing Chicago? <coughs> no, we, we usually ship the traffic every five minutes. So if you notice that Chicago is overloaded, we ship traffic away from Chicago in the next five minutes. Well, I'm talking about if, like, say, for instance, here in the library, the DNS is cached. How long do you, do you keep the cache uh, oh, two minutes. time low? Or? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Yeah, but not everybody respects it. We expect this. Usually the browser, because we have the DNS to tell, but the worst thing against us is not the DNS, it's the browser pre establishment So if you're using a, a modern browser, like Chrome or Safari or even Firefox, the browser will keep the connection open for several minutes if you have the tab. So usually people access Facebook and they leave Facebook open like four hours. And the browser will keep like a pool of connections open. So even if the DNS changes and uh, you, you go to Facebook and you click like or whatever, the browser will try to use the same connections. So that's why when we shift the traffic to a different pop, the traffic doesn't move immediately. So I'll show a graph later that shows the decay. Like when we move the traffic and when it actually happens. And the, the main culprit for this is the price. And, uh, but the DNS is two minutes. Usually, sometimes it's one minute. But one minute, we, we didn't notice someone, a big difference between one and two minutes. So we give it two minutes. And uh, so basically, that, that, that's what we do. It's a, it's a, 
it's a very, very simple experiment, so it's very likely that you will never see it. But if you have the chance to see it, you'll notice that even if in each profile picture will be matched for a different one. The way that we do it is to, because the problem that we have is the DNS cache, and we need to skip the DNS cache in order to fetch one profile picture from any different plot. So the way that we solve this problem is by using random host names. So we have, for each profile picture that we were fetching, we will have a different host name. So there is a 100% of chance that the host name won't be cached in the SP because it's new, it's random. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the, the diagnosis, like a, the profile, the, the diagnostic tool in Chrome, you notice that each profile picture is being fetched from a, a very different host name. And that host name will never be related. Because we don't want we don't want we don't want to take the chance of the ISPs to cache this, and that, that's the way we solve the problem. So when we have a DNS request, that's the only information that we have. We have a unique hostname because we know that what we're trying to translate, and we have the resolver API address. So a common misconception is that when uh, when somebody is querying us for the host the IP address for www People think that we have the client IP address, but we do not. We only have the resolver IP address. So when you ask, when you ask your ISP for an IP address, the ISP resolver will ask the IP address on your account. And the, the, the server on the other side will never know the, the, the actual client IP address. There is an extension to the DNS protocol, it's called eDNS0, that supports this. So Google will start supporting this with the 8888 and OpenDNS open already supports this. Uh, the reason this part is, is that it's, it's very difficult for us to route, route people that are using Google DNS to the closest block because they are all querying the same DNS uh, server. Right. So the only thing that we know is that oh, this query, this query is coming from Google, and I don't know what to do with it because I don't know where the user is, where the user. Is. So this is a big problem with the eDNS zero extension. Google will tell us, hey, I'm Google, and I'm asking for that 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 Facebook. This is the client. And then they can mask the client. There, there is a lot of uh, things for privacy, so they can mask, they show only the first 24 bits instead of 32 bits. So we don't need the 32 bits to route the user. We only need to know the netblock so we can cross this with the geotag and all the other information that we have. So we can use, we can route the user to the closest point. So, and uh, we do not support that yet. This is in development, and uh, we push this in, in production in the next month. So today, if you are using uh, the Google DNS, there is a pretty big likelihood that you are, you are misrouted to, to some of the pop that is not the best. There's a pop probably close to the DNS server. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> Google has a pretty good infrastructure here in most of the countries. So I think here in the US, it is not a problem. If you are like in the Central Africa and the closest 888 would be like Europe, we we'll probably want you to Paris instead of robbing you to Cairo. That would be really close to that. And uh, <clears throat> so once you fetch the picture, actually, so the first thing that you need to do is to translate this address, and then you fetch the, the, the picture. So when you fetch the picture, we, we have all the information. So you have the unique host name, so you can correlate this. We have the client IP address because you were fetching actually, so we can process this. And we have the run through time because after fetching the picture, all the pictures, the, the browser will create a, a JSON structure and the centrals, like I, with all the list of pictures and all the around your time. So we, when we have more and more and more information on this, we can cut it up layers and we have like a very successful This is pretty cool and uh, this is the way we solve the DNS route across the world. It just works amazing. So when we, put, when we first put this in action, and uh, we, we start with two clusters, so the other the correct lines here, the good lines, we're using the old system, the business solution. And then we, we, were, we were pretty confident that no, not our system will route like much better. And then we put this information, this one. And uh, so basically, as the traffic went up to one, it went down to another because it was overreacting. Yeah, so imagine like you were driving your car and the, the car starts to steer to the left and then you do like a big correction to the right and then you, you have to correct the problem to the right and then you create like a huge wave of overreaction. And then, yeah, it took us like <laughs> seven years to figure out the problem. We really didn't understand what was going on because like we were reacting correctly but why we were just amplifying the wave of like mistake that was, was happening. 
and then we, we eventually fix it. And the problem is that I was talking before, I was talking about it before, is that the the amount of time that it takes for us to move DNS traffic from one site to another. Because we're not taking into consideration the established connections from the browser. We're only taking into consideration the DNS detail. So we thought that if we change the IP address, and we have a TTL of two minutes. In two minutes, the whole, all the traffic, most of the traffic will yeah. shift to the next block. And actually, it was taking half an hour. And why half an hour? Like, even if the DNS servers, they don't respect the TTL, like, they, they won't, they won't like, respect to the point of going from two minutes to 30 minutes. They could, like, go to three or five minutes, but not that now. And then we start studying this, and we got this conclusion, basically. So, so most of the traffic, we will ship in the first 10 or 15 minutes. Then we have a huge long tail of traffic. So this is <coughs> pretty great. Especially cheap forms, those feature forms that we sold in India and China, they, they really do not respect that. So when they get the IP address, they find to cache the IP address for like 12 hours. They, they really don't care about like what's the, what the TTL is. So it's very common when we train pops, like let's say it's like, 7.40 now and I drain a pop now, tomorrow morning I'll still get traffic. It's very, very low, but uh, it's a huge long time. So basically, we so we stood that decay curve for, for several days and we come to a mathematical model. So the, the real is the, the, the red one and the green one is the predicted. So we have this prediction curve now in cartographer. So when cartographer moves traffic from one part to another, it, it will wait for the whole 85% of the curve to actually happen before doing before doing an overreaction on that thing. So that fits the pre previous problem. So if you look at the graphs today, it's much more beautiful. It's hard to look at way because we have all the time zones there. But if you look at it correctly, you notice that <coughs> this is when we start sharing. So basically, the traffic is running up. The traffic would go, the organic traffic would go all the way up here. But cartographer notices that the pop is close to 100% capacity, so it starts shedding the traffic to the pop. So when we are here, basically we are at peak. So you notice that those curves are happening in different time frames. That's because the because of the requirements we're taking. So we have peaks in different times. So. So this works pretty well. So we never had a problem anymore. And, uh, mm -hmm. So this is the topology. If you look at the given cluster, right, we have we, the way we lay out the network, we have the data center, and each data center has a couple of clusters, like 10 or 20. And uh, each cluster has like a bunch of questions, 10,000. And uh, this is the way we, we, we lay out the clusters on, from a network perspective. So the first thing that we have in the data center, that's out of the cluster. So the cluster would be this boundary. And uh, we have the DRs. The DRs are the data center routers. So we usually have a couple of them, like four or six or eight in some the center. They are huge boxes. Like, they weigh like a thousand pounds. Like, they are a whole rack. Like, hundreds of interfaces all the time. Really. And uh, so those routers, with those routers, we talk to trans, we talk, we talk to the backbone, and we talk to peers. And then in the clusters, we have cluster suites. So usually per cluster we have four cluster suites for redundancy. And uh, actually we with one, we could handle the whole traffic with just one, but we have four. And uh, usually the cluster is pretty big. One cluster would be probably bigger than this one. And we have one cluster switch at the corner of the cluster. So if you have fire or anything, we can contain the problem and, and we can leave the whole cluster still running. And, uh, and then we have racks. So we use triplets. So our racks is designed by ourselves. It's, Open design as well. So we have three bit racks. Each rack will have like as it was three racks, and then we have twin servers in each of the the, the rails. And then we have like six, like six to fifty servers per rack. It varies a little bit. So in each rack we have a rack switch, and uh, the rack switch is not redundant. So if you lose the rack switch, we lose the whole rack. This this is not a problem at all because all the servers by requirement and by design they need to survive a loss, the loss of a whole rack. So if you, need, if, you, if you build a new server at Facebook, your server must survive, uh, it must survive a loss of a huge uh, <coughs> entire data center. So if you lose like all prime view, your service need, need, needs to run in other data centers. So this is required. So uh, Facebook's not a big bunch of, a big chunk of code. It's basically the site is run by more than 400 services. So we are talking to the front end, 
and the front ends will talk to the back end service to actually build what we need, what we need to see. And that's all, all the hard work is done by the, the back end. So we do a lot of PHP, but PHP is on the front end. The hand stuff is all the as well. And uh, so back to the network. So we have the switches and we have a rack switch. And then from the rack switch, we have our forward balancers where we basically, the L4 load balancers, the load balancer, the L7 load balancer. The L7 load balancer are the, is the same thing as saying a reverse proxy, like an HE proxy or an HMX, a squeeze, or an Apache, or like that. So when, you, when you're talking to Facebook, we're always talking to the L7 load balancer. You never establish a connection here. So only the L7 load balancers will talk to the web server. And uh, so these guys here, they have cache, they have like all the logics and everything. These guys here, are, they, they load balancers, they also have load balancers. So, because we have too many of them, so we need like an intermediate layer. I'm responsible for this guy. I'm the service owner of all this layer here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if this, go, if this goes down, basically the whole site will go down. You know, and uh, <coughs> so we have 10 giga, uh, 10 giga NICs everywhere. So all the network is 10 giga. And the uplinks from the rack suites to the cluster suites is usually 40 gigs, and some high bandwidth racks we have 80 gigs. And uh, the amount of bandwidth they have from the cluster switch to the data center router is absolutely insane. Half <laughs> And uh, so, in the router perspective, right, basically all the network 3GP, that's the only router protocol that we use. So, each, uh, in all the network is level 3. We don't do VLANs or anything. You know, yeah, so each rack has a IPv4 it has a slash 24, and uh, also a slash 48, I guess, 486. And uh, everything is routed. So the racks, all the suites are level, level 3 suites, and the rack has also has a router. And they talk BGP to the cluster suites, and they talk BGP to the rest of the network. The backbone is an PLS, and over a PLS with an IP. That's for, for balance. Right? And we also use ECMP. ECMP stands for Equal Cost Motor Rack. So all the links are active, active. So there's no hot standby. So if I have uh, 40 gigas or like four 10 giga links between the right suite and the cluster suite, we use all of them at the same time. And uh, that's uh, that's supported by ECMP. That's that's a common thing. It's nothing new. Uh, from this, between these two layers here, we do DSR. That's direct server return. That means that the L4 load balancer they only see the ingress traffic. So the incoming packets go through the L4 load balancer and get distributed to the L7 load balancer. The L7 load balancer they will respond straight to the to the clients. So that's a very common uh, load balancer layout, and I would really recommend if you guys are in the load balancer to do this. And uh, we use round robin here for for the servers, and then this layer here we use just run because it's too many servers. So we just run and select one and magically. <laughs> and uh, I'll talk a little more about this next. Uh, so the L7LD is proxy. Uh, we use everything that you can make. We use Nginx and we use HAProx, Varnish, Squid. And uh, they're all fine. Like They all get the job done. But as we started scaling and scaling, we got to a point that you know, we need to do something. And basically, we got the, the main strengths of each one, and we built something that uh, would solve our problem in a much better way. So I think this will get the source of so I hope. <laughs> and uh, so basically, it's, it's, it's nothing new. It's just OpenSSL, we use it for the speed, we use speed lay, HTTP parses, Node.js, Deep Event, it's, an, uh, it's an, a synchronous IO server. It's also plus plus. It uses Lua for the, all these script mechanisms, so we do it with the for the time. And uh, it integrates very well with our infrastructure. So that was the main reason that we built the process. So we have an integration <coughs> mechanism where we can deploy services everywhere. Instead of each server has have a, having a config file, it talks to the configuration infrastructure, hey, I need my configuration. And then we send that. That's all we actually need. We have all the more monitoring infrastructure. We have alarming and logging. So there is a big framework to coordinate all of this. And that was the main reason that we did the proxy. The same thing with the L4 load balancer, the one that we have so my main project there is called Shiv, and uh, it's based on an IPVS director, so it's not different than this. So if you if we install Ubuntu and uh, install FTF, install IPVS at the end, it's the same thing. 
But we, I built, we built basically a whole locker around it that's using Python that orchestrates the whole thing. Because the IPVS does not do health checks and doesn't do monitoring and army and everything. So basically we built uh, a whole script, not script because it's too big, but it's a whole software that you can Python around it. Then we do the health checks and it talks to the configuration mechanism and does monitoring and army. But the load balancing itself, like the hard work is done by the kernel uh, using IPVS. IPVS is pretty good. It's not the best thing in the world. It has a lot of bugs. We have contributed to the kernel fixes some bugs. We still have a long list of which these bugs are used to fix it. But it works pretty well. Like a lot of sites, if you use like Amazon Elastic Load Balancer and other cloud solutions, they're all based on IPVS. Uh, in terms of proportion, so the L4 load balancer is not first layer there. We have singles to tens per cluster. Usually it would be like six or ten. It depends on bandwidth. They don't have too much CPU work because they are only dispatching packets. So it's more like network bump. So if you have a cluster with a lot of traffic, a lot of incoming traffic, let's say video upload or like photo upload. So we will have more of those because we have too much traffic coming in. As I, as I said before, it, it does not see the traffic that's going now. So the second layer would respond straight to so in the next layer, that's the L7 production, we have usually tens to hundreds. So we usually have 100, 150 per cluster. And then we have the web servers. So that's thousands of web servers per cluster. So I could have always paid like many, many, many. <laughs> <laughs> It's insane. Like it's, it's, a, it's a big number. Uh, so come back to Edge. So I'll explain a little bit better how uh, the Edge works. So imagine if you were in Porto Alegre, that's a, a city where I'm from, in South of Brazil, and uh, you want to talk to Facebook. So the closest data center geographically is for the city in uh, North Carolina. So the, the latency to there is 75 milliseconds. of days. So if you wanna if you wanna talk to Facebook there, the first thing that I need to, to do is to establish a connection. So that would cost me like one and a half long trips. So that's basically 200. That's the TCP handshake. So that would cost me like 150 milliseconds. But today we do 100% HTTPS for security. And then we have two more round trips to actually exchange the keys and blah, 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 all this sort of stuff. So I'm already like almost half a second. And then I fetch the, I actually send the request and then it's gone. So I have 600 milliseconds only to give, only network time. Of course the application here will take like a second more to actually render the whole so I'm spending 600 milliseconds only network time to get the net, to get the connection established and to get some code. So when you go to a block, as I said before, we have just a few servers in the top. And uh, it would be like not more than 200. So they are pretty small. They are not our, uh, we only rent some space in the big data center. We don't build anything. And they usually have like one rack switch uh, we, should, we should have like a router also for the peer and everything. And uh, we have two load balancers, or four load balancers, and we have 20 or 7 load balancers. So these machines, they have lots of memory, 200, even 400 gig of memory. Absolutely. So because they do cache, and they have a lot of flash disks and spinning disks to do cache static content, like photos and videos. Yeah, but they don't have web servers. So they, they can only proxy back requests, and you can send, <coughs> they can serve the best from, uh, from, the, from the cache. So going back to the map, so now instead of Porto Alegre talking straight to the for the city, Porto Alegre can now talk to Sao Paulo. She or you is the airport code. We use airport code for the use from our side. And uh, so, so between Porto Alegre and Sao Paulo, I had 15 milliseconds instead of 60. So the network would be something like this. Uh, so I would establish the whole connection of the SSL thing in 9 milliseconds instead of 400. And uh, the request, of course, I need to proxy the request <coughs> back to the, to the data center. So that would still be the same thing. But the total would be 240 instead of like half a second. Uh, but most of the times for the static content, usually most of the stuff that you were fetched from the site is a static content. Because you access your news feed, there's a lot of pictures. And each picture is a different request. So those requests, most of the time, and almost 80% of the time, they will be served by the pop itself because of the cache. And then, would be something like this before and after would be something like this. So that's the reason that we invest a lot of money in pops because it lowers a lot the latency. And that's the reason we have like big CDN networks like Akamai and Amazon Alpha and 
and not all apps, they are growing a lot because people want to be closer to the users. The experience for the, it might be just a milliseconds if you look at the mathematical, but the, the experience for the user is much better. Especially if you're using TCP and we like have a packet loss and we need to resynchronize to, to get back the packet that we lost. So all of these happen much, much faster between the top and the users than going all the way back to the center. So before, so before having the pops, this was the map of layers. So green is good, all the rest is bad. <laughs> so we served very well in the United States and then parts of Mexico. And all the rest, I'm sorry, And then we started to grow the pops as we had the first pop, things like we had much better. And this is a bit old, but I think it's, much, it's still much better now. So Brazil is fully green now. And uh, we have parts of Asia that are much better. And uh, it's a big difference, especially for the users, it's a big difference. As I said before, as we're moving to mobile, pack to us is now a constant problem. So we always have pack to us in front of 3G and 4G networks. So TCP is boring. TCP was designed like several years ago. And you never take it, you never took into consideration like wireless networks. And uh, so it handles pretty, pretty bad. Like you need all the packets. If you lose one pack, your whole stream is in the right way. And then you need to you need a recovery mechanism to recover the packet that you lost. And that costs a lot of run trips. So as close as I am to, the closer I am to the user, the better and the faster I'll be to solve that problem. And uh, that's why a lot of people in research is in university. Universities have been studying the next, the future protocols to replace TCP on this front because TCP is pretty bad. So we need to get an answer in the next, next few years to replace TCP. So Google has something they are working on quick. MIT has been doing like a lot of work in the eight eight. So it won't happen soon, but it will happen like sometime. Hmm? IPv6 does not solve the problem. No. It's yeah, IPv6, uh, yeah, because the, the main problem that we have today in terms of round trips is the, is the L4 layer, not the L2. So IPv6 solves a big problem, the net and the lack of IP address. So for you, for you guys to have an idea, we are, our network, our network inside the data center uh, is addressed with a 10 slash 8 network. And then we are running out of IP address. So our whole slash 10 is basically running out. So the new clusters, I think most of Iowa, probably all of the clusters will be will be IPv6 only. And then in a few years, all of all of the clusters will be IPv6 only. So we only talk to the internet and do a stack and do IPv6. And the reverse procs, the L7 procs, we will talk v6 to you. We we'll talk v4 to the clients or v6, and we we'll talk only v6 back to the servers because we don't have more address And uh, this is very limited. And today we, we have IPv6 everywhere today, but it's always that. And uh, so this is my team. It's a little bit out of date to have a few more people. So most of the teams there are pretty small. This is considered to be a big team. So we have 40 people. So we don't have one. And uh, so most of the stuff are run by a small group of people. And uh, most of them are super smart. This is pretty cool. Yeah, very glad to work. I like the guy in the red hat. Is he useful? The center camp? Yeah. Second row, second from the right, second from the right. Oh, right, yeah, that's, that's the manager, actually. He's the manager. Younger and younger. Yeah. Well, he must have been in the Does he want to go out? Yeah. He's the field tester. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so that's it. I'm over for questions, so feel free to.